Okay, so uh, today I'm going to build on something that uh, I was talking about yesterday, which has to do with the hidden mentions of Horachti, the name of the uh, statue, the Great Sphinx, and Mehit. And in order to demonstrate this, I, I had looked at Pyramid Text 260, the first eight columns on the south wall of the antechamber inside the Pyramid of Unas. And so what we're going to do today is to continue on uh, to see how incredibly this whole wall is a projection into the sky, basically. Um, and so in order, before I do that, so I first want to actually show the sky. So that way we have, we have an image of the sky and then we go back to the wall and then we see how the wall recreates the sky using text and topography, meaning it doesn't just matter what the text is saying, but it matters where the text says it. So um, this is a view of the ecliptic. We are uh, in the old kingdom time, 2352 BC. And I just picked this particular year because it allows me to show the waning moon with the face pointing to the west. And I just uh, about to cross the Milky Way. The Milky Way is this hazy or pacified band here. And I've taken out the, the, uh, the haze of the sky just to highlight the position of the Milky Way. And you see the ecliptic line with some of the zodiac constellations. Here is the star Sirius, uh, just uh, heliacally arose. This is summertime. So in the summertime during the Old Kingdom is when you had heliacal risings of Sirius. So here's the star Sirius, here's Leo, and the sun hasn't uh, arisen yet. So this is in the early morning hours. And the goal of this, this video is to show you that what the pyramid texts are telling us about is a journey of the star soul of, this, of the king, the ach, the ach, the combined ka and ba, the life force and the soul, manifest as this, the star Sirius. And this journey is now a journey where the, the royal spirit is basically escaping from the Duat, which is on the west side of the Milky Way, in order to go to the Achet zone, which is on the east side, where Leo is. Uh, so what we're going to look for, therefore, is a description in metaphorical terms of this journey. So what the soul does, it ascends first up on the west side of the Milky Way, all the way to the moon, the ferry, and then with the ferry, it will cross over to the other side and then eventually end up over here in the east. And so the question is, can we show this using the text? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, there are several elements in the text and they're positioned in such a way that both the text and the position help us to come to this conclusion that this is exactly what is being described. Um, and so, before I go to the text, I want to reiterate something that I mentioned last time, and this has to do with the two names of the Sphinx in the New Kingdom. Uh, this is the Great Sphinx. There's the granite plate called the Dream Stealer. This was left by Tatmos IV. He was a four, uh, New Kingdom ruler, so this was not an inscription that was made at the same time that Kafir was alive, the king to whom at least the face of the Sphinx is attributed by Egyptologists. Um, but on the stone plate, you can see two sphinxes and the name of the sphinx is written above the head in two copies. It says Hor, Hor M Achet, which is Horus in the horizon. And then there's another name written in the text. This is the text of the dream stealer, which tells the story of Thutmose, how he fell asleep by the sphinx and the sphinx asked him in his dream to clear her from the sands. And then he, uh, and then the Sphinx would make Tatmos the ruler, and that's what he did, and he became the king. And so, but here on the second register of the text, you see the name Horachti, the living statue. So we have two names for a monument that didn't have a name apparently in the old kingdom. And the the explanation for this is something that I started talking about in the last video: is that the statue itself was taboo 
it was not to be mentioned. And which is strange because of course it was such a prominent part of the landscape, the most famous statue even now in the world. And it was not to be mentioned in the old kingdom. Um, but this is not uh, uh, the topic of the talk today. I mentioned it, uh, some of the reasons why, uh, but today I'm just going to go back to what Robert Bouval published in, uh, in the recent years. Uh, most recently in Origin of the Sphinx, where he felt that maybe the Sphinx was mentioned in the pyramid text uh, under the name Horachti. And uh, Horachti, Robert concluded, is the image of the Sphinx in the sky. So even though the statue may not be mentioned under Horemachet, but the image of the statue in the sky, which is the constellation Leo, according to Robert, was mentioned, and that is Horachti. And so we're going to see that name in a few moments on the south wall of the antechamber inside the Pyramid of Unas. Uh, so let's go to the virtual pyramid again. This, is, this has been a good friend to me because it allows me to orient all of you that have not been inside of this pyramid. Uh, this is uh, courtesy of the Egypt Exploration Society. It's a great, uh, uh, incredible program that they made here to be able to see the interior in this way. So I'm going to go back out first just to get oriented with you. So we're going back into the entry corridor. This is now coming from the north. There's the entry and I'm going to turn around. By the way, these are the portcullises. So these used to be the blocking stones that uh, closed off this entryway. And then so here is the entryway coming into the, the interior of the pyramid here. You see the granite turns into limestone and that's where we have the first inscriptions. This actually turns out to be the very end of the pyramid text. So the, the last segment of the pyramid texts in the pyramid of Unas is this wall right here. This is the last column and that is the last symbol of the pyramid text. Um, anyway, so we're going to go into the chamber now. So what we're looking at Coming from the north, we're looking at the south. So this is the south wall of the antechamber. Uh, here's the ceiling. To the left is the east wall and to the right is the west wall. Uh, just to give you a full picture, here's the corridor that will take you to the, yeah, that was a little bit too close. So let's go. This is the serdap, by the way, it's the tripartite alcoves that are not inscribed and this is past the east wall of the antechamber and then this is the corridor that goes to the sarcophagus chamber and again this is the west wall so the wall that we're interested in is this one here and i'm going to take a step back virtually speaking so we can center the wall and just recap the area that i uh discussed last time so these first eight columns is what I focused on in the last video. And now what we're going to do, we're going to extend the analysis over all the way to uh, the part where we talk about the actual transfer over across the Milky Way using reed floats, uh, where Unas, the spirit of Unas, meets up with the sun and with Horachti, which is, according to Robert Puval, the, the name of the Sphinx in the sky, the constellation uh, the constellation Leo. Uh, so we're going in, in this, this part of the text analysis will take us to approximately approximately halfway across this wall. Okay, so we're going to end up about in this area when we're done with that analysis. So uh, now let me exit from the virtual pyramid. And now what we're going to do is to go to the text. Have to uh, now i've i've preloaded some of the key features so um and i'm going to open this in paint so i can annotate it as i'm going along i'm not going to read all of the text because that's going to take way too long today and it's not necessary because i've done all the work up front so i can show you i can show you the relevant areas that matter so first of all let me zoom out a little bit so you can see the full 
the full text of it and we have to move this to the center to make it easier to see. So that's better. Okay. And now here are So here's, uh, this was, if you remember, pyramid text 260, PT 260 is what we talked about, what I talked about yesterday. And I have to make the writing a little bit bigger so it shows up better. Yeah. So this was pyramid text 260 that continued on over these eight columns. And uh, where I stopped, where I left it off yesterday, it was over here at, uh, at that sign. And so then it continues on with pyramid 261 and then pyramid 262 and pyramid 263 is the actual description of the crossing over. Uh, and I will focus now on the name Horachti which is which is over here. So this is Horachti. Well, I'm still playing with the setting so I can I can show this the best way for you. Okay. All right. Um, so here, here we have, here we have the name Horachti. And uh, now I've drawn, this is fascinating because it just underscores how the topography of the texts are important in reading them, uh, and especially in understanding to the topography of the sky. And you would never know this if somebody didn't actually look for it. So, uh, if you remember, here is the here is the reconstructed name of the statue itself, Hor M Achet. This is how I put this together in the last video. That this is a cryptic way to refer to the statue. And look what happens when you when you look across from the ach sign, hor em achet, this is the ach sign. If you look straight across horizontally, you end up with horachti, okay? And of course, that is the journey that is, is uh, occurring in the sky. As I was just showing you, the goal of Pyramid Text 263 is to take Unas across the Milky Way over to where Leo is and where the sun is, because the sun is about to rise into the sky, into the summer, uh, into the summer azimuth, which is around 62 degrees uh, uh, north. Um, and so, and so here we have this incredible placement of the symbols of the two names of the great Sphinx, Horemachet Hor and Horachti. And it is recapitulating this very, idea that you have basically the statue connected with the statues in the west which is the necropolis giza and it's looking across the nile over to its image in the sky which is of course to the east of it right and so that is what we have because of course west and east if you remember this is the west aspect of the southern wall and this is the eastern aspect so everything uh, everything matches. It's it's perfect. So uh, now, now, um, but let me show you the other elements that I just mentioned to you. So remember the the idea is for this the reborn Ach spirit of the king that in the for, in 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 its manifest in his manifestation as Sirius, the idea is to ascend on the on the west side of the Milky Way straight up by the constellation Lepus. And of course, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew 
this constellation, if they recognize a rabbit ears with a rabbit tail, we don't know that, but I am going to show you something that will make you wonder if they may have known. Uh, and then past Orion, the Duat is, of course, this whole area. This is the netherworld where a resurrection occurs. And that is, of course, the equivalent of the sarcophagus chamber, which is to the west of the south wall of the antechamber that we're discussing right now. And then further up to the constellation Taurus, which is the which is a bull, basically. And then here is the moon, the moon fairy. And we can set the moon fairy back a day like that. Um, just to make it clear that it's still on this side of the Milky Way. And then, uh, and then we cross over to the east side. So this is now what I wanted to show you over here. Uh, so in Pyramid Text 262, 262, which begins over here, you have a repetitive formula where uh, I'm going to skip over 261 for now. There's something I want to show you a little bit later, but first we're going to talk about 262. And there's a repetitive formula where, uh, where UNAS is basically encountering several different entities. And the idea is that UNAS knows them and they know UNAS and therefore they should allow UNAS to pass. Okay, that's the idea. Um, and just to give you um, just to give you an example of what this sounds like, so let's go to uh, let's go to this one here because it's e the easiest to read in this way. So uh, it says basically, do not ignore unas, m naichem unas. Uh, and then it says basically uh, that Unas knows you and you know Unas. And this formula is repeated with several of these entities. So we have first, we have just a God, okay? Generically, it's a specific God, but it's just not, but not mentioned directly by name. It's a God. Then we have Ra, the sun. Then we have Jehuti, which is the moon. Then we have Sabdu, which is Sirius. Then we have the one in the Duat, which indirectly speaking is Orion, okay? And then we have Kapet, which is the bull in the sky, okay? And interestingly, if you see how this ascends up on the wall, so the, the, the lowest one on, on this, tot so to speak, totem pole, if you wish, uh, is the god, then comes the sun, then comes the moon, then comes Sabdu, then comes the one in the Duat. And so it's beautifully done because it's it's visually, it shows you an ascent, basically, come, going up something. Then after that, you actually have a mention of a description of the Milky Way. So that's what, that's over here. And what that says is the White Palace, or our hedge is the White Palace, of the great ones, the Uru, uh, on here means uh, at or on the mes, the mesket, and here's the determinative explaining that uh, I'm sorry that this image I spliced this together from different photos from Piankov, but this is basically the Watt sign, which is a pathway. Uh, so it means that the White Palace uh, is the great ones at or on the pathway. Uh, of the stars, Sehedu, okay? Uh, and the, the, this is a specific pathway, it's the beaten path, basically. So it's a, it's a broad avenue, a boulevard, so to speak, of the great ones. Uh, and it, it is in the shape of a white palace. And this took me the longest time, to be honest with you, to figure out what is this white palace? And then, and of course, it occurred to me that it is this entire band. This is the white palace. It looks gigantic, of course, but in this particular view, on in at this in this season, the Milky Way does go straight up into the sky, and it looks like a white palace. So it's a very descriptive term, uh, and it is both the white palace and it is composed of a boulevard of stars. It's uh, entirely descriptive and fascinating how it's done, 
but if you don't know this, if you don't realize it, then the language just, you know, you, you, would, you would think this is a real palace. Uh, it's an actual place or, or you wouldn't understand it. So that's why it's important to, uh, to realize that all of this has to do with astronomy. This is basically applied astronomy in a metaphoric sense. Uh, and so the, the other thing I, um, I wanted to point out is now we're going to go back to Pyramid 261. And uh, I got to center this so you can see the whole picture. OK, so uh, let's go back to now Pyramid 261. Pyramid 261 is, comes after the, remember, the first eight columns have to do with judgment. It has to do with the fact that uh, Unas wants to be uh, it wants to be vindicated in the uh, in front of the tribunal uh, of the netherworld and at uh, in presiding over this tribunal uh, was Tefen and Tefenet and so basically orphan and orphaness. Um, and that's a nice, by the way, a nice uh, uh, clue that they were self-created. So they didn't have parents. And this is something that will come up on another wall where they were, uh, or Shu and Tefna, the double line, uh, are actually specifically mentioned as having self created. So they're not from a parent or not from parents, they're self created, which goes with the idea that it's referring to a statue that was always there. Um, but this is a, a side issue. I just wanted to point out that it, the theme of Pyramid Text 260 is this judgment, and it has to do with order. If you remember, uh, Maat is basically coming along with Unas. Uh, and, and so, for example, here it says uh, near Maat, he's bringing, he's bringing it and it, it, bring, it is next to him, uh, next to Unas. But now with 261, we, it changes an interesting tone in an interesting way because now we talk about chaos. And to, to give you the upshot, at the end of 261, chaos is actually mentioned in the form of set. Uh, so here, it's not too clear, but here's the symbol of set. And what Unas is saying, Unas here, this last bit, it says Unas is the one that is doing a mission for set. And the mission is chaos. It's talking about lightning strikes. So here, for example, uh, here in... The lightning strike is mentioned. The lightning strike is here. It's called is called hen, henbu, and there's actually the determinative for the strike. Henbu literally means the tuft of an animal tail. So maybe it's a descriptive term that lightning sort of looks like uh, the end of a lion's tail or something like that. But so here we're talking about lightning strike lightning strikes, um, we're talking about here something which is also fascinating. Um, so Unas is going to be on, he's basically predicting that he will be on the Eastern side, Ayabeti and Menu, uh, Hut, Huit, okay. And so literally what this, this is how Allen trans, Peter, uh, James Allen translates it as, uh, as Menu, he translates as quartz and Huit is rain. So it's basically quartz rain. So Unis is going to be on the eastern side of quartz rain. And what is quartz rain? Well, Alan trans translated it as hail. So this is a storm we're talking again. It's, a, it's a basically a lightning storm, a hail storm. But if you think about it, it is also a metaphor, quartz rain, for exactly what we just talked about over here. Quartz is white, it's glistening. That is basically the white palace of the great ones on the boulevard of stars. So you can think of this as two different metaphors that is, are being used to describe the same thing, the Milky Way. So it could be a rain, this could be conceived as a quartz rain cloud in the sky. And you can also look at it as a boulevard of the stars. Either way, and these are just two ways of, of saying it. So the fact that there's chaos is just, it's just a beautiful poetic way to describe this part of the sky as being chaotic because you have this cloud of white raining down from the sky. It's beautiful. Um, 
and of course, it is also in alignment with the Nile River. So the Nile is the on the ground representation of, of this band of stars in the sky. So back to the text. Uh, I um, wanted to point out a couple of more things that are interesting regarding uh, a, maybe a cryptic reference to the Sphinx statue. Although I have to tell you, this is not, it is not as compelling as what I discussed yesterday, but it's just wanted to point it out. I'll leave, I'll leave it up to you to decide. So for example, here, this is part of Pyramid Text 261 again. It starts saying that Unas is the one who has woe in his heart. He's the son of Aib Shu, the son of the mind of Shu, so to speak. So, uh, but then it says, uh, Aoi means uh, it's extended and Aout means again extended. So it's, a, it's an extreme form of extension. And when I read that, I, of course, I had to think about the extended body of the Great Sphinx. Uh, is this a cryptic way to refer to this unnaturally elongated body of the Sphinx? Um, and then after that, we have another difficult phrase. It was difficult for me anyways to, to figure out what it might mean, but it literally translates as, um, aze, this is azeb, and then you have this interesting determinative, which I'll go in a minute. So we have azeb, ayahu, ayahu means light. And azeb, the translation is basically uh, glowing, fiercely glowing, glimmering, um, but what does this head, this is actually, uh, this is a lion head. Uh, and there's really only very few words that use this in the old kingdom. And the, it does have a phonetic value. It has to do with time, with moment. At is basic, that is the phonetic value of it might be at. And that goes with the frontal half of the line, which is hat. So there's a relationship between the lioness head and the lion head, uh, hat and at potentially. And then the meaning of at is a moment. It's, a, it's time, it has to do maybe just an instance. And so if you combine that with this idea of azeb, which is being on fire, being a glimmering, glowing, then really what this may add up to is a spark. So, um, so this could be a spark of light and a spark of light, of course, reminds you of Sirius, which is mentioned later on, subdue over here, right? And so that is the, the this incredibly bright cutting light at the at time of the heliac rising when it cuts through the sky and it produces the spark of light. Uh, it's, if that's what it what was meant, it's it's incredible, it's beautifully done. Um, but um, but I just wanted to point out that there is a potentially also an aspect of the statue of the Sphinx with this overextension here. Uh, and this would be an example of Heka where you have one idea expressed in, hidden, in a hidden sort of fashion embedded in something, something else or something, in, something that's related, um, but you're actually trying to insinuate something else, which is this, ex, this idea of being overextended. Um, okay, and so now, uh, now let's go to the actual journey. Um, but yeah, I wanted to just uh, show you the stations here one more time. So we have the sun, we have uh, the god, we have the sun, we have the moon, then we have Sirius, Sobdu, we have the one and the duat, and we have Kapet. And guess what? That is what we have lining up here on the side, right? We have we have Sobdu, we have Sirius, we have the constellation, uh, we have uh, the one in the duat that could be this, but there's something else that I'm going to point out that makes you actually consider that this could be a rabbit in the sky. Then we have the one in the duat, which is Orion. We have Tor, the, the, the sky bowl, which is Taurus, the constellation. And then we have Jyoti, which is uh, representing the moon. And all of that, all of them are lining up on the west bank of the Milky Way. And that is why they're mentioned in this particular fashion over here. Now, of course, the sun is on the, on the east side and that doesn't quite fit the picture completely. And I don't have a good explanation for it, to be honest with you. I'm, I can only point out the, the, the features that do make sense. And most of it does actually make sense, as you can see, not 
if it's not perfect. So for example, I don't know who the God is here and the son mentioned here. Why is it mentioning in this part of the text? Not sure. Um, now, the other thing regarding this uh, rabbit uh, is over here, back to pyramid text 261. So here, this particular, it's talking about the red crown, which is actually in my reconstruction in the northern sky. And eventually, Una says, Ba wants to go to the immortal star zone, the peri, uh, the, the stars that are uh, revolving around the North Pole, the celestial North Pole. And so that is net, the red crown, cast by the god. And then look what it says here, unen un nf means open for him, aimu, the ones that are in motion, un unit. One one eat, and it is the it is the it is using the rabbit sign, just like Unas's name uh, has the rabbit sign, which stands for un. So the the ones that are in motion are the aimu un unit, and if you go back to the sky, the of course what's in motion is the ecliptic, and and the stars on the ecliptic are the ones that seem to be moving uh, the most swift. Uh, okay, so it could be that the Ununit are represented by this constellation Lepus. It's possible, but it could also be just the stars that are lining up with the ecliptic and that are basically considered the, the motor of the sky. And in fact, as you might know, the ancient Egyptians had a timekeeping device at least probably already in the old kingdom, but for sure in the middle kingdom, and that was the deacons. Uh, the deacons were basically slices of the sky uh, that took uh, basically 10, that took a few days to move on to the next part of the sky. And that's why they were called deacons because it took 10 days for each one of them. And what the deacons were exactly, is not so easy to reconstruct, but they may have been pairs of stars that cross the ecliptic in sort of a band-like fashion. And those might be the, uh, the Unwunit that are mentioned here in the pyramid texts. Um, so anyways, I uh, wanted to bring all of this out. Uh, I know it's a little bit haphazardly, but uh, it's just so good to give you a taste for how this wall projects the sky using text and topography. Um, but the most incredible aspect of it, of course, is this, the actual crossing, which involves a boat. And that, that text is, this is the text that Robert Bouval was citing in his own studies um, where he concluded that this Horachti must be Leo in the sky. And I think he's absolutely correct because if you given everything that I just talked about, uh, the topography of the text, it makes perfect sense that this would be Leo waiting over here in the, in the Eastern part of the ecliptic for Unas to arrive from the other side of the Milky Way. And so let's look at, uh, to, to end the video, um, this presentation, I just wanted to give you a little sample of this, this text. So it says, uh, like uh, most of the pyramid texts, it begins with, it begins with this uh, words to be spoken, Jet Medu. Uh, and then it says, uh, give, It says, uh, it says basically give or place a canoe, a canoe which, is, which is the reed float uh, of the sky, canoe pet. I'm just gonna cross out the words that I'm translating. So canoe pet, uh, so that ja, ja means cross, to cross, so that he, he cross in it, I may, uh, with respect to the achet, the horizon, okay, give, and then the same thing again, give a, a reed float of the sky to Horachti, okay, so Horachti is the first one to cross, that he may cross in the achet, okay, that, that Horachti may cross the achet, and then repeats the same formula for the sun and for and for unas eventually so the idea is that every they're all crossing over to the other side 
of uh, of the achet, which is basically the achet, of course, is the horizon. And so they have now Leo and Horachti and the sun have crossed the achet in the netherworld and have now are now emergent in the morning hours above the horizon. Okay. And so Unas wants to do the same thing, but Unas takes this pass, this path up into the ecliptic, and then he will join them by by uh, by rafting basically down the ecliptic. And this is actually mentioned in the text as well, because there is a mention of the winding waterway. I don't know if it's uh, on this. I'm not sure if I have it in this particular section of the one that I'm uh, of the south wall, but it is uh, specifically mentioned. It's called uh, Merencha. Merencha is the winding waterway. And it says that Unas is basically traveling on the winding uh, waterway. And that proves that what we're talking about is is the ecliptic. Uh, yeah, so this is how I, uh, it's, it's not, I don't see it right now here on this, in this, it's probably after this, um, after this column, it might be, but yeah, I'm not seeing it here. So um, anyway, so I just wanted to recap this real quick that um, we are on the south wall of the antechamber and what we have here in the first few columns of it, uh, the first half of it is an astronomical journey by a resurrected star spirit of the king that is attempting to ascend up in by the but on the east on the west side of the milky way and uh, and i forgot of course to say that even that is mentioned so you um the as the act the actual asset the ascent of it is even that is mentioned and there and there's also a mention of a ladder on the north wall so it's really made double stitched and triple stitched that there is that is really clear what is being described um it's not trying to hide it it is actually trying to make you understand it um, and if you look for confirmation you usually end up finding it um so that's this is the incredible thing about these texts but um i just wanted to show you to end this i just wanted to show you this idea of the um the ascent. So here it says, remember, this was the quartz rain. It says, Unas will be on the east side, Ayabeti, Menu, Huit. So uh, on the east side of the quartz rain, which I think means the Milky Way. And then it says, Ainenenef, bring to him Ayat, which means the ascent. It's a pathway, or you could say a ramp if you want. Uh, or it's a, some kind of an ascent up. N means two, and then heret means to the, to the above. Uh, so there's, there's explicitly mentioned in this entire context that it is an ascent. And then on the other wall, like I said, in column 13 is actually the mention of a specific ladder. And that again, I think is just a ladder of the stars. It's just another way to describe the Milky Way. Okay, so... Um, that's it for today. Uh, I am going to end it, and the next video is going to talk about the uh, the other half of the southern wall, which is obviously full of information.